Let's, uh, let's wrap up here by talking about this strike in Syria, where even more so because of uh, their ethnicity and race, people in the U.S. don't care at all that a bunch of civilians were killed. Uh, this, in a way, Pad, uh, kind of, I feel like, confirms of some of what me and Will had been talking about and reporting back in 2016 what was happening in Syria and Iraq and basically trying to understand how the U.S. was possibly coming to the conclusion that they weren't killing civilians when they were bombing heavily civilian populated areas. We had talked to in 2017 some special uh, forces guys, a Green Beret, who uh, kind of laid out to us how the Mosul bombing happened and how indiscriminate the strikes were there and how many civilians potentially were killed and how absolutely awful that was. And so this comes as absolutely no surprise to me whatsoever, anything that we find out in this article. And hopefully it's uh, let's kind of start working here for us. Um, but ba basically what you have is the New York Times going through and uncovering that in, I think, March 18th of 2019, the U.S. dropped a bomb on 80 people in Syria and about 64 of them at the very least were women and children and they called it a legitimate airstrike and they chalked it up as being and are still standing by it even after this New York Times report came out. I saw it today they're saying that it was a legitimate strike, Pat. Um and they're saying that because women and children could possibly have been used as militants by ISIS, then essentially anybody was a potential militant. Yeah, I mean, it kind of reminds me of the My Lai massacre a little bit to make kind of a parallel. I know that in My Lai, it's alleged that I think it was between 350 and 500 people were killed. Um, and I, again, the argument there being that while they could have they could have given material support to the to the VC or something like that. Um, but it, it's just sickening, Kyle. And and it really it, it does remind me of of the one that we just covered in Kabul. Um, but man, I, I I was looking at some of the so NPR, there's an NPR article. I don't know if I sent it to you or not, but they go over what the conditions are that the US military has to meet before they can use lethal force against a terrorism suspect. One of oh, them is near yeah, I didn't load that one up okay. because I, I don't think that those rules of engagement were actually in place in 2019. I think those are from the Obama uh, era. Okay, well, okay, so good point, and thanks for pointing that out. Well, but it was going to lead me into what this loophole is, and this loophole that they discuss in the New York Times article is imminent threat. Yep. And it seems like this imminent threat is this completely elastic provision yeah. And, and so, you know, this is, uh, I think, a situation that's very similar to kind of the policing problem in the United States, where it's a far more cultural issue than like a legal one. And so, you, you know, saying that we're going to charge police or, do, you know, require police to go to sensitivity trainings and all this kind of stuff isn't going to uh, prevent the, these kind of like, you know, mass murder situations from happening. And simply changing the language. And so, like, I think under the Obama, at the end of the administration, they had it as being like, you know, there would have to be a near certainty of no civilians being killed before they could launch a drone strike. And then the Trump administration, they changed it a little bit to, like, make it, like, almost a certainty, but that, like, made it so they could carry out more strikes or stuff like that. Now the Biden administration is going to change. Nothing really changes because they could basically bomb whoever they want and get away with it. I mean, as we see in this case, the reporting is crazy, where you actually have military officers, not just some rank-and-file private, you know, who is sitting at their computer or something like that, but military officers who were generally like surprised. They did not believe that these airstrikes were carried out. They, they were like, we just watched a bunch of civilians get murdered right in front of us. And then not only that, they actually took it up and tried to make an issue of it, suspecting that war crimes were committed and nothing came of it. It, it almost sounds unbelievable if it wouldn't happen all the time. Yeah, it's it's just sad, and and it, it really b comes comes into question how many are dead, how many are dead that we don't know about, 
Oh yeah, I mean, and the, I, you know, this is like the tip of the iceberg. This is something that I talked about a lot on the show with the uh, recent like strike in Kabul. You know, this was the one-off example of where there's actually enough reporting and enough looking into it, where this is the one time where you actually had somebody in the military that was so disgusted by this that they really tried to make an issue out of it, or else it would, you know, just gone by uh, without another, and even after they make an issue out of it, the Pentagon's still going to stand by it. So this is one of the points I really want to make on this and how I want to tie this story in with the first two, where you look at who's guilty of murder here. And, you, you know, there may be some questions about particularly this strike or task force nine group uh, that was operating on the ground and apparently ordered the strikes. But really, you know, Pat, I imagine if you would go after the head of central command, General Kenneth McKenzie, who, again, is also the general uh, who is in charge of Afghanistan right now. And, and, you know, maybe you went after it at a top level and allowed and sent this guy to the ICC, right? Let, let him go to the international court and face crimes in front of the Hague. And if they find him guilty to go ahead and lock him up for life, you think that the next general in charge of CENTCOM is going to let this kind of stuff go on without any care? Uh, that, that seems to be that like to be one, one of the main differences that, uh, that can make. Um, uh, again, Again, Pat, the, the most striking part of this article to me, and I feel like they almost buried the lead a little bit in this New York Times article because they focus so much on this one incident in itself and the fact that it wasn't investigated, uh, but rather that CENTCOM was counting anybody who essentially anyone who was big enough to hold a rifle, so, you know, nine, ten years old. It seems that they were all counted as potential militants. So how how the hell many people have we killed in Syria? Uh, you know, and, and this this is the kind of thing that should have outraged the left in that they should have been trying to impeach Trump on for four whole years. This happened during the Trump administration. This is murder. These are 64 people who are just trying to go about their lives with just completely eliminated. And who knows how many of the other 16 people they claim were ISIS fighters just happen to be males. I mean, Pat, you know, if you're walking down the street with your wife and children and they kill all of you, they say, oh, we got one militant and three civilians. Well, that's not true. You just happen you know, to be a military age male, a ma'am. And so then, you know, your life is automatically forfeit no matter what. Uh, me or you, you know, they could kill us and never have to count us as a, a dead civilian. Uh, it, pretty much unquestionably. I don't know what, what else do you have on that. Who do you think should be held accountable here? I don't. I don't know. I like. I. Everyone in the chain of command. I mean, everyone who greenlit this. And and I, I've done some work on this. I mean, the the moral culpability for soldiers who are acting under orders. I mean, do you believe that the whoever the was it the, the pilot that dropped the bomb? I wasn't clear on that. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, typically the pilots get told to drop the bomb or not. And uh, from my understanding, I don't think that they have a whole lot of like time to like be like, oh, it looks like there's people down there. You know what I mean? I think right. that they're hitting the fire button before they even see the situation. And so in, in like the case of a drone operator, I think then the person who hits the red button could be held far more accountable because they're watching what they're firing at, where I think just the kind of the way the technology of the fighter jets and how they work now, you know, they're, they're flying around. And, and so maybe they are, and they did say, they dropped three bombs, I, I think, in this case. And so it is possible that, you know, if any of the fighter pilots did potentially even realize the people down there were, were civilians, I, I think that's very problematic. And of course, you know, if you are a fighter pilot, a part of the U.S. military, I mean, any just basic looking around of like what the U.S. military does and who they bomb should make it that you you, you can't participate in that, right? Like you're kind of guilty just by knowing that it's kind of likely that you're going to kill a civilian. If you're a fighter pilot in a U.S. war drone in order to drop bombs, they're not good at hitting their targets. There is no intelligence. These people are just absolute morons. You know, the, Pat, they still can't find the ISIS K safe house that they say was the reason <laughs> they blew up that family uh, in Kabul a couple months ago. And, and so there's, there's no intelligence here. They just hide behind 
behind the the words and stuff like that um I don't know. I think that's like that. Those were like the main things I had on this strike. Uh, I do feel like it really confirms a lot of what me and Will have been talking about on the show for the past couple of years and uh, just how careless the drone strikes were not only in Afghanistan where it was kind of assumed and we do know from some reporting that they were killing anybody who was riding around uh, on like a motorbike with a hand radio or something like that but also in Iraq and Syria where these seem to be the rules of engagement that anybody could be considered a militant so long as you weren't like you know maybe like an old man with you know in a wheelchair or an infant yeah, and see, I wanted to maybe unjustly give them the benefit of the doubt, these officers who who tried to push this issue, and say that maybe in the past all the, the drone strikes that they've had, the majority of the ones that kill civilians are maybe where where militants or military-age males run into a house. And there's a bunch of kids in the house that we just can't see. Probably safe to assume that lots of houses are filled with kids from a, a sane standpoint. But from their standpoint, they can't see them. I, I don't know. Or it's an instance like the one I covered, uh, the the drone strike in the Pesh Valley uh, that the Intercept covered in depth. That it's a truck. There's a bunch of people in the truck. They look like adults. Let's launch that missile. Uh, that doesn't absolve them, but at least that maybe, I guess what I'm trying to say is that maybe the only reason this one really came to light is because it was clearly a fill a field with women and children in it. There's no different kind of circumstance like a truck full of people or a van full of people or you know alleyways or children playing in a courtyard or something like that or children in a house. This is a field with women and children. Clearly bomb drops kills them all. I kind of I had a little bit of a different interpretation and maybe this is more cynical on my part of why this is uh, came out. And it actually has to do with the fact that there were two drones in the area when this happened. One had standard definition and one had high definition. And at least according to The New York Times reporting, the task force nine that actually ordered the drone strike only had access to the standard definition and when was unaware of the high definition drone footage. And so I almost wonder wonder maybe if the the you know the, this represents uh you know bureaucracy differences within the Pentagon right here and part of what you're seeing and why somebody is upset and really running this up the flagpole also has to do with the fact that this task force 9 was kind of stepping on their territorial toes and made a big mistake and embarrassed them and so you know we're going to make sure the right people get embarrassed in all this and they're actually not as concerned about the dead civilians and Syrians as it might seem uh but pat you, you know there there's so much focus that's placed on these small criminal offenses in the united states and not that th- these aren't important but m- the 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 amount of people that are wars the literal piles of dead women and children i mean 64 bodies is a pile of women and children that are wrapped up in these kind of uh murders mass murders atrocities aren't even like remotely thought about or like meant to be addressed nobody's upset nobody cares everybody you know everybody will have like the down to the last detail well not everybody but people have down to the last detail of the red house trial or everybody will have a formed opinion on it but nobody will even care bother to read this new york times piece or watch a three minute video on it of what happened in syria even though i mean the death toll is multiple times higher well one of the one of the things that really presses me to do the work that you and i do you more so than me kyle but um you know every night i go up and my four month old it's it's our schedule that you know i take him into the bedroom and i change him get him ready for bedtime and I swaddle him and I look into his eyes and he's so precious and so special and covering the things that we cover that you cover thinking about someone a continent away driving you know a remote controlled vehicle dropping a bomb on him and completely taking that innocent precious life and destroying it 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 just it makes you it's revolting that's I mean it's the worst thing I can possibly imagine. And then I imagine that happening to someone else's child. It's infuriating. And moreover, the fact that 
that someone might convince my boy to sign up and do this and that he would have to carry the moral weight of doing something I hope he wouldn't understand the consequences of. But living with that guilt for the rest of his life, uh, it's infuriating, Kyle. Yeah. How much, and you know, I, I think this ties into the kind of Rittenhouse thing too. One of the things I really don't like about the kids, he's a little cop lover. He's a cop worshiper. It's true. And it, as much as like, you know, I, I don't like that about him. If you're a 17 year old boy who grows up in America, it's kind of hard not to love the military and the cops because that's who everybody is constantly making a hero of for you 24 seven. It's a real cultural thing. And, you know, people want to talk about Kyle Rittenhouse, you know, how much glorification that we give to our cops and our military is it should definitely be a part of the conversation on how to fit uh, the problems, you know, that, that some of the problems that we have. But uh, unless you have something else, we should probably wrap up the 